Hello everybody, uh, welcome to the second day of PGConf Brazil. My name is Fabio Telles from Timbira and tonight we have the honor to introduce to you Mr. Bruce Mongia. Oh, let me turn off the, the audio here. Okay, um, let me introduce you Mr. Bruce Mongia. Bruce Monja is co-founder and core team member of Postgre Global Development Group, group and has worked on Postgres since 96. Uh, he has been employed by Enterprise B since uh, two, 2006. He has spoke at many international open source conferences and is the author of Postgres Introduction and Concepts, published by Edson Wesley. Prior to, this, to his involvement with Postgres, Bruce worked as consultant development custom database application for some of the world's large law firms. As academic, Bruce holds a master in education, was a high school computer science teacher and lecturer international internationally at universities bruce will talk about window functions and during his talk you can make questions to him and in the youtube chat while he's talking at the end of his talk i will make some questions from bruce answer uh, reading from the chat so let's begin bruce uh, now it's up to you great Thank you, everybody. Hello, everyone in Brazil and around the world. Buenas noche. Um, it's uh, great to be talking to everybody from Brazil. It's been a long time since I've been down there, and uh, I hope to get down there soon. But um, I have very fond memories of all the time I've spent there. Um, I'm excited you're doing an online uh, conference this year. Fabio kind of put it together, Fabio, and I think it was really uh, kind of a neat idea. Uh, I know we got really good response yesterday, and I'm excited about uh, presenting today to you. Uh, it's um, it's kind of an interesting talk for me, so I, I have it's a little close to my heart. Uh, this is only the second time I'm giving it, so I'm really excited. Um, and in fact, this talk I actually started working on uh, six years ago. <laughs> um, uh, Postgres added window functions in 2011, and I started working on a talk, and I could never kind of crack how window functions worked and how uh, to understand them. And only in the past six months I've been, have I been able to understand them. And fortunately, I was able to put together this 80 pr slide presentation and I'm excited to be giving it to you today. Um, I think it's gonna be interesting. Um, it's gonna be a little confusing, like the concepts are really uh, pretty complex. Uh, but by the end, I think you'll you'll find that you have a firm grasp of this. I actually showed it to somebody uh, recently, and they said, you know, I never really understood what the functions until I saw this presentation. So uh, I know I learned a lot writing it, and I'm hoping you're going to learn a lot in watching it. Um, again, yeah, it's really neat to be doing this online. Um, I do travel a lot, so the ability not to have to travel and to present to you is uh, is really a win. Um, in addition, again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat window, and at the end, uh, Fabio's going to Fabio's going to kind of give us a, a list and, and ask. Uh, I'll be able to answer all the questions. Ideally, I could answer them during the presentation. We decided that it's better for me to go through it, and then and then we'll ask we'll answer the questions if you can at the end. Okay. Um, so unless there's any questions, uh, there are any problems, uh, I think we can get started. So this is the outline um, of what I want to cover today. Uh, a little daunting. Um, obviously, we're going to start with an introduction to what window functions do. Uh, but then, then we get back, we get into the weeds pretty quickly. Uh, the window function syntax is not for the faint of heart. Uh, the SQL Standards Committee did a pretty uh, good job of uh, sort of laying it out, but it's pretty complex. Um, and then we're going to talk about specific syntax with um, with window functions using generic aggregates, things like sum and count and so forth. And then we're gonna talk about the window specific functions and then finally close out with a whole bunch of examples of window functions. Uh, and then at the end, there's a couple slides that kind of explain what, what's going on. Um, actually, uh, Father, if you could back up one slide, I wanted to show you something on the first uh, slide there. 
Um, take a look at the URL right there, um, right here, the momgen.us. This presentation is available online. So if you want to download it right now or look at it while I'm talking uh, or look at it later, uh, that URL there on the bottom right is where you're going to want to go. Um, so there's probably 25 presentations, 30 presentations on my website. Many of them have videos. Um, so feel free to kind of browse through there. Uh, you might find something interesting, including uh, this talk, which, which uh, again, I only finished probably a month or two ago. Thank you. Uh, let's go to slide three. Okay. So um, introduction to window functions. And, and it's kind of cool. I got little pictures for each one. So it's kind of, kind of interesting to kind of keep people uh, interested in what's going on. Um, basically, window functions are part of a larger set of features uh, that Postgres provides. Uh, this is a bullet list of basically all of the data analytics features uh, available in Postgres. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of them, standard aggregates. I've talked about things like sum and count, standard deviation. The optimizer in a lot of ways is, is involved in uh, data analytics. Uh, Server-side languages, of course, PLR is a good one for data analytics, and window functions I mean, highlighted right here. Uh, then like bitmap scan, table, table spaces, data partitioning, um, uh, materialized views, common table expressions, Britain indexes, grouping, grouping sets. These are all, again, part of it. Window functions is just one level. It's basically the, the, uh, the sort of window function level. Uh, so when you're analyzing data, the ability to sort of express things in the SQL analytical things that you want to you want to do with your data. And again, by the end, I'm going to show you a bunch of examples. I think you'll be pretty excited about what you can do with these functions. I will admit that, um, and I actually, when I gave this class the first time, somebody said, they said, you know, usually when we write a window function, we find somebody who wrote something that does something similar to what we want. We take it, we kind of whack it around and until, and until we get the answer we want, and then we call it done. <laughs> okay, that's really the way a lot of people have had to go at window functions because it is just so confusing that you kind of find something similar, you kind of whack it around a little bit, and you, it, you just walk away. Uh, my goal here is to give you a real full understanding of it. So you're going to basically come out and see, you're going to say, yeah, I understand this, and this is exactly what. Uh, the type of capability I want. And you're going to understand that window function instead of just taking a blind one and whacking it around, you're going to know what you're doing. And I think that's going to be a real value here. So what is a window function? Um, a window function, and again, I'm not going to get into all this text, um, but it basically allows you to do calculations across a set of data um, that is related to the current row, but it actually... It does not group all of the rows into a single row. It kind of allows you to look. It, it takes the current row and it allows you to introspect around that row and give that row a specific value related to some rows that are around or near that row. And I think that's the concept you have to get across. If you think of the normal use of sum or count, you know, you get one row, you get one sum out, or you get one count out, or you get one count out for each group. When you start to look at window functions, you're going to have the ability to basically do, it's not going to coalesce all the rows into one value. It's going to basically uh, retain the distinctness of each row. Okay. Each row is going to retain its distinctness. I think that's the key there. Okay, another thing about this thing, um, there's going to be a lot of queries here. So when you start to look at a slide, keep your eye on the red text, okay? Um, because, for example, in this one, you can see where the red text is right there, and that's where you want to look at because, again, there's a lot of information on a lot of these slides. We want to make it clear to you, okay? So here at the top, we're basically showing you a, a sample of the query we're gonna use for these examples, okay? And it's basically just the numbers one to 10, we're using generate series, and we're just gonna generate numbers, okay? So this is just kind of count to 10, we're gonna use this sort of as a, as a framework and build on top of it and show you a lot of examples around this query. In addition, at the bottom, 
all of the queries that you see in this presentation are actually on my website as an SQL file. So if you want to go now or later, you can click on that and download the SQL file and run it through PSQL and you'll see exactly the same thing that you're seeing um, on my screen. So let's get started. This is our first window function, yay. Okay, um, I'm not gonna claim this is a super interesting window function, okay? And you, I'm gonna, you'll see why in a minute, okay? But the, the real uh, trigger here, uh, and the reason I know it's a window function is the word over. And you're gonna see that, yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna see over, over and over again, right? Um, the word over is basically a keyword that identifies that I wanna go into window function mode and I want to, I want the current row to do something related to the rows surrounding it, basically. Okay. So this is probably the simplest window function. We're basically doing the same query, numbers one to 10, you can see on the left-hand column. And then we're having a second column, which is a sum over, in quotes, over, and a no, a, and then just parentheses. There's nothing else. Okay. Just parentheses after the word over. And what that effectively is doing, it's saying, take the current row and give me the sum of the current row plus all of the other rows in the set. And that's why you see the number 55 over and over again. Okay. It takes the first row and it says sum the first row and all the other rows in the set and put the number in the current row. Take the second row. Take, add it to all the other rows in the set and put that number there. The real takeaway here is the word, the use of the word over, and second, the idea that it has not collapsed down all of the rows into a single row, okay? You still see each distinct one to 10 row there, right? It's just that you don't, you, you, your, your actual value is kind of related to that. So this is why it's different than doing a normal aggregate we're actually retaining the distinctness of the rows and we're doing something else, okay? Now here's a more complicated example, okay? But it has it really similar. We're doing select, we're using generate series one to 10. The first column is the count, okay? I mean, is, is based, I'm sorry, first column is, is X. The second is count over parentheses, parentheses. And the third is sum over parentheses, parentheses. You can see we're starting to build here. And the count is exactly what you'd expect. Row one, count the first row and all the other rows, it's 10. Second row and all the other rows, it's 10, so forth, okay? Real easy to understand. Again, we're starting really slow, so we can kind of build up to understand how you can, this is, this is you'd never do this in real life, okay? This is just an example of what you can do with this kind of thing. So here's the, here's the third one, okay? And we've added a new concept called a window clause. And a window clause is effectively the area in red there at the bottom where we've specified a window word, keyword, and, and, a, and a label, okay, an identifier called W. And what we're doing here is we're taking W, we're making it synonymous with the parentheses, okay? And then up top, we're saying count over W and sum over W, right? And that's exactly what you want. We're taking count and sum over W. Instead of having to put parentheses, we're now, re we're now kind of using an alias as W for meaning the whole thing. Again, there's probably no value to doing what I'm doing here. But the idea is you're now seeing a window clause. And as we get farther along, when I use window clauses in appropriate places, you'll understand what they're used for. Okay. Okay. This is our first kind of real window function. Um, and what I've done here is I've taken the parentheses, which, um, you know, was closed and open and empty. And I've put the default value in there. And this is kind of daunting because there's all these work keywords in red. And you're like, what do they mean? The beauty is we're going to, we're going to go over the meaning of every single one of these keywords. Okay. Basically, the default for a window function is range between 
unbounded preceding and current row. Okay. I know that may mean nothing to you, but that is, that's the default. And I'm going to show you exactly what that means as we go forward. Okay. Great. Window function syntax. Let's check that out. Okay. So having shown you like really simple window functions and really simple window clause, I'm going to actually show you the syntax. Okay. So if you look at the syntax at the top, this is the syntax for a window function. It's the word window, a parenthesis, and then an optional partition clause, an optional order by clause, and then an optional range or rows clause, and then an optional frame clause. I know that sounds like completely um, overwhelming, but by the end of these slides, it will make a lot of sense, okay? Um, this syntax is basically taken from that URL right there, which is where the Postgres docs are. Um, the Postgres docs, when we originally added window functions, were really hard to understand. I worked a little bit to kind of improve, improve them somewhat. Um, and we've got some small improvements actually in Postgres 10 coming with the docs. Uh, but in general, once you go through this presentation, the docs will make a lot more sense to you. Okay. Um, my point here in the bullets is that fra the frame definitions can either be unbounded preceding preceding, current row, following, and underbounded following. I'll show you what those mean in a couple of minutes. Okay, so what are the faults? This is the same clause, range between unbounded preceding and, and current row, okay? So what we get out of here um, is the concept that the partition clause by default is not active. The order by clause by default is not active. Um, the range clause is active by default, um, uh, and um, I know this is kind of confusing. Again, so you, when you when we come back to it, I think it'll make more sense. Um, but effectively, there is um, there's some relationship between order by and range and current row that we're going to get into, and I know it's kind of confusing, um, but I just want to give you the syntax so you can kind of see it. Okay, so I, this is this is I think um, a pretty clear slide. Once once I walk through it, uh, you might find yourself coming back to this if you're studying it. Um, I will say that these slides are really kind of meant to be studied. Um, you may need to come back and re-familiarize yourself with some of the concepts. Okay, but let's take a look um, just at the just. Let's go from left to right. Okay, so if I look on the left. I have a set of 10 values. Um, they're actually duplicated. So I have one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, and five, five. Okay. And what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and explain what the terms mean that we're going to be talking about later. Okay. So the first, uh, first area there is the literal current row. Remember I said window functions basically have you looking at the current row and, and returning a result related to rows around that row, okay? So let's suppose that that particular row that we're highlighting there on the left is the current row, okay? But that's the current row only we're in, when we're in a mode called rows. And again, I'll get into that in a minute, okay? The second bracket, okay, is basically the current row if you're in range mode, okay? So basically, if you use an order by clause, and again, I don't expect this to make sense. We'll show you examples. If you're in range mode, okay, which is the default, the current and you use order by, then the then the current row is not literally the current row. It's actually the current row and all of its peers, which in an order by situation would happen to be all the rows that are the same value. Okay, so I know this is really confusing. I had a lot of trouble understanding this. We do have some examples coming forward. Um, but the idea here is that when you're looking at a query and you see the word current row, and I know this is crazy, it doesn't always mean just the current row. It could mean the current row and all identical values in that, in, in that table, 
Okay. And it can actually mean more than that if you want, but I'll get to that. The third bracket um, is basically the clause rows unbounded proceeding. So what that means, it means that it's the current row, which in the case is three, and then all the rows before it. Remember I said unbounded proceeding is one of the options in the frame clause. Again, I don't expect you to understand it. When we get to it, it'll make a lot of sense. The fourth one is the same, except if you use an order by, and therefore you're in range mode, then it's all of the current values plus all the proceeding. And then the last bracket is a partition, okay? Which in this case is the entire set, but we'll show you later how you can create partitions and actually partition your data. I know it's really hard to explain this at this point. Once we get to the last couple slides, it'll it'll finally make sense but i feel i had to give it to you so that you can go when you're looking at it going back it'll it'll make sense to you so um what i've done here is i've taken the previous slide and i've actually used the frame clause from the window function to literally tell you exactly what that bracket represents so the first bracket represents the frame clause in a window function calls called rows, current row, and current row, okay? Uh, meaning we're going from the current row to the current row, which is one row, okay? The second bracket is order by X, range current row, okay? Which means it's the current row plus all of the peers of that current row, which happen to be all of the threes, okay? The third bracket, rows unbounded preceding, um, those are, that's the current row and all the rows before it. Order by X on the bounded proceeding is, is actually all of the peers and the rows proceeding. And then finally rows between unbounded proceeding and unbounded following is effectively the entire partition. Because you're saying, take the current row, go all the way to the beginning, go all the way to the end. Okay. Um, again, it doesn't make a lot of sense now, but when we get there, it will. Okay. Let's talk about specific examples of window functions with aggregates that you're familiar with. And this will start to kind of make sense, I think. Okay. So um, we're back to our original query. This is the query we saw before. Remember, it's the select X. It's the count over W. It's the sum over W. Remember, we saw this before. And we have a window clause that says range between unbounded proceeding and current row. Okay, now we can start to kind of make sense of this, right? Because now we see the range word, we see unbounded proceeding, and we see current row. The first thing you're going to freak out about, and I did too, is how come it's going, it's looking at all of the rows in the set if the last word is current row, okay? And the reason is because we have not used any kind of order by and we're in range mode, it assumes every row is the current row. I know, it's completely confusing. Um, I don't know why they did it this way. There must have been some genius idea. But effectively, if you've not created an order by, there's no, and you're in range mode, every row is considered to be a current row. Um, that's the, this is the weird part. When they say current row, it isn't literally the current row. It could be all of the rows, or it could be all the rows that have the same value, or it could be some other subset, depending on what your order by is. I, you can see why it took me six years to kind of get this. Okay. So, ooh, ooh, something happened. Like, look, it's something changed. Look at the numbers at the bottom, right? This is good. Okay. What have we changed? Let's take a look at the text, text in red. The only thing we changed is previously that word that says rows used to say range, okay? And when you go into rows mode, all of a sudden you get something different, okay? So effectively what's happening here, when we were in range mode, because there was no order by, every row was considered to be the current row, okay? As soon as we went into rows mode, remember you can put either range or row in that spot. So rows mode, current row literally now means the current row. Okay. So when I say rows between unbounded proceeding and current row, it's effectively taking the current row 
it's going to the unbounded preceding, meaning the earliest row in that set or that partition, and it's going all the way out to the current row. And it's doing a count and a sum. And if you take a look at those numbers, that's exactly what you're getting. Okay. The reason the first column and the second column are the same is because the first column is effectively just the numbers one to 10. The second column is literally counting how many rows are before my current row and, and my current row. Okay. So those are not computed the same. The X is literally, those are integers. The count is effectively counting. The reason there's a 10 at the bottom in the middle row is it's saying the current row and they're all rows proceeding count up to 10. Okay. The sum is really where it gets clear. Okay. First row, one. What is one plus all the rows preceding? One. What is two plus all the rows preceding? Three. What is three plus all the rows preceding, meaning two and one? Six. Four plus all the rows preceding? Ten. Five plus all the rows preceding? Fifteen. And in fact, when you look at the bottom row, 55, that's the number we had before. It's adding all the rows. It's adding all the, all the, all the X's effectively. Okay. So here we can start to just kind of glimpse at what's going on when we switch from range mode to rows mode. Again, a completely trivial example. Okay. Now, um, what I did was I got rid of the default. Remember I said the default is range unbounded proceeding and unbounded and, and current row. Effectively, I don't have to specify current row because that's the default. I get the same results here. All I had to do was type unbounded proceeding. In fact, I don't even need that either, but I think I needed that to put the rows clause there. Okay. Um, now we have a different, different setup. Okay. Now we're doing rows between current row and current row. Remember before it was rows between unbounded preceding and current row. Now it's rows between current row and current row. And if you look at the results, it makes perfect sense, right? Look at the middle column. What is the count of the current row and the current row? The, there's only one row, so you get a one, okay? If you take the sum of the, the right-hand column, if you take the sum of the current row and no other rows, it's the same as X. Okay, so you can start to see we're actually now kind of getting to somewhere. Maybe I could make use of this, right? I know it's still kind of stupid, but you can now see I'm actually controlling what's coming out by using this frame syntax. Okay, um, now, now I'm actually using the defaults again. I'm saying rows, current row, I get the same result. Because remember, the default is rows, current row, no, the default is unbounded proceeding in current row. The second part I didn't need anymore, so I just say rows, current row, and I get, I get the rows, uh, the same result. So I'm using some defaults there. Okay. Now I'm doing it different, complete, I flipped the whole thing over. Now I'm doing rows between current row and unbounded following. Again, the red text kind of tells us where to look. So I'm saying take the current row and go all the way to the end. And what you notice is the numbers are all flipped. So the current row one count from the current row to the end is 10 from two from the current row to the end is nine and so forth. Last row and the current row is one. And then the number, the sums flip as well. So you take one and you add it to all of the next to the rows, you get 55, the 54, 52. It's kind of weird. It kind of goes down really kind of at a weird progression there. Um, but and that actually makes sense. Now that makes sense. So my goal is, I know it didn't make sense before, but now what I'm doing with these frame clauses should start to make sense to you. Okay, now we're gonna get a little more interesting. Okay, we're gonna use the word preceding. Remember, if you remember the syntax way back, some of my options were current row, unbounded preceding, unbounded following, and then also one of the options was a number and preceding. So what I'm doing here, and you can start to see where it becomes useful, I'm saying rows mode between one preceding and current row. Okay, and I've actually now done a count, a count with an X 
which actually handles duplicate uh, nulls a little differently, and then a sum. Okay. So if I take a look at um, at the count, this is the row two, it's going to say what's the count of the current row and one before it. There isn't any row before it, so effectively just one. Every other row has a row before it, so all the other rows are two. Okay. Um, the interesting part, and the reason I have two count columns, I want to highlight there at the bottom that effectively the row that doesn't exist isn't null. It just doesn't exist. So it's doesn't, it, it doesn't come across as a null. If it was to come across the null, the count star and the count X would be different. I know this is a concept of aggregates you might not be aware of, but when you do a star, it counts nulls. When you put a column in there, it doesn't count nulls. And effectively, I'm trying to show that. And then if you took the last column, effectively, it's taking the current row and it's adding the row before it. So one plus nothing is one. If the second value, three plus two, or two plus one is three. Uh, three plus two is five. Four plus three, I'm sorry. Uh, four plus three is seven. Five plus four is nine and so forth. You can kind of go all the way down. All the way down, it's 10 plus nine is 19. Okay. So now, remember I told you window functions allow you to go up and down within the set, takes current row and use a value in that current row related to rows around it, you can see that's actually exactly what's happening here. Okay, similarly, if we wanna use the word following, so I can say uh, the current row and one following it. So in this case, one, two, you notice there's two, 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 two in the middle column, and then row 10, it's just a one because there's no row after it, okay? Similarly, if we look at the sum, it's one plus two is three, two plus three is five, uh, three plus four is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting confused, seven, and so forth all the way down, okay? Uh, so instead of using proceeding, we're using following there. Okay, I used one proceeding, now I'm using three proceeding, okay? So now I'm saying, Give me the three rows before it and the current row. As you can see in the count, it goes one, two, three. And now when you hit four, there's now three plus three rows before it. So it's four all the way to the ring. And again, the sums are exactly what you'd predict if you did the three rows preceding it, preceding the current row. Um, now um, we get a little more interesting, and this is something you haven't seen before, is the concept of order by. So instead of putting rows mode or range mode in here, I just put order by X. And when I did order by X, effectively what it has done is it's, it's, it's switched me um, effectively into kind of a row mode or range mode, but now the range is from the, beginning to the current row. I know this is kind of weird, um, but effectively, and, and I, I, you'll see a lot of examples. I'll, I'll read what it says. The current row peers are rows which are equal to the order by columns or all rows of uh, all partition rows if order by is not specified. So what happens is when you go into order by mode, um, your current row is defined as itself. Uh, it's not defined as the whole set anymore. This is, again, extremely confusing. Um, but that's the way it works. Uh, you, again, there's no row mode here mentioned. Um, you would think that we just get 55 all the way. You don't. As soon as you do order by, then each row becomes its own sort of peer row. Instead of the whole set being a peer row, it's just the current row. Again, it's really confusing. I'll show you a lot of examples as we go forward. But you just got to get used to it. That's all I can tell you. Um, and again, uh, with the order by, I'm expanding out, I'm showing you the full frame. So what effectively happens is without the order by, current row becomes the entire set. With the order by, current row becomes all rows that have the same value as its own, have, have identical values. And this is the weird part of that. The definition of current row changes when you add an order by in there. And, and it's just, they just have to get used to that. I'll show you a lot of examples as we go forward. Um, here's, a, here's a better example. Here is a range query where I'm saying order by X, range current row to current row. Um, effectively, you can see that it's now 
honoring, even though I'm in range mode, okay? Even though I'm in range mode, we have, um, we have current, current row just means the current row. And that's why you see ones in that column there, in, this, in the middle column. Okay, so let's get a better example to really illustrate what's going on. So I'm not going to create a table, which is going to have a lot of du duplicates. So instead of having one to 10, I'm going to have one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, and six, and, and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to have 10 rows, but every row is duplicated. And I'm going to run queries just on this table. And here's where it gets a little, here's where we start to get interesting. Okay, so first we run this, the first query we saw was the one with the window clause that's empty. Remember, just parentheses, parentheses, okay? And this is exactly what you'd expect. Instead of 55, because we're not counting to 10 anymore, we're just counting to five, effectively we get 30. Because if you add up all those numbers, it, it, it equals 30. So that's like completely trivial. This is not trivial, all right? And this is where you start to see what that order by does, okay? So if you take a look at the count column in the middle one, okay, what you notice in the first row is that when I'm doing a count over X, count of X over W, okay, I count two rows. And I count two rows because the two, because of my order by, the two ones, because they have identical values related to the order by, are considered to be the current row. So when I say, when you say current row, it actually can be more than one row. So this is just what it is, okay? It's basically saying that you have two rows, the first two rows are effectively considered to be part of the same peer group and are considered to see, and the sum, if you look at the last column, is actually two because it's adding one and one. And the second one, if you see the two twos, that has four in the middle column because it's counting one, the one, and the two, the two, because remember the default partition clause is unbounded preceding to current row. Remember, unbounded proceeding to current row. So effectively, it's totaling, it's going from the first row, unbounded proceeding in their set, and it's going all the way to the end of the current row, which in this case is two rows. And that's why the next group is 6-6, six, six, because it's all the same in 8-8 eight, eight and 10-10. Ten, ten. And if you look at the totals, again, they're all the same. All of the, all the values that have the same X have the same sum. Okay, and that's because range mode, unbounded proceeding to current row is the default. Okay, so this is the default clause, right? I'm, I'm, I'm expressing it out here. Range between unbounded proceeding and current row. So this is kind of spelled out. Unbounded proceeding means, well, range mode means all the current rows that are the same value by the order by, okay? Unbounded proceeding means go all the way to the beginning. Current row effectively doesn't mean always current row. In range mode, current row means all the, cur the current row plus all peers, meaning all values that have identical order bys to them. This starts to make a little more sense when you actually look at a use case, because right now I'm just showing you, and it's kind of, kind of hard to kind of get it. Okay, watch, look, look what just happened, okay? I was, I was in range mode before, now I'm in rows mode, all right? And I've got a completely different result. When I was in range mode, current row meant current row plus its peers. When I'm in rows mode, current row means current row. And what's cool, interesting is if you look at the count, it doesn't say two, two, four, four, six, six, eight, eight, ten, ten anymore. It says one, two, three, four, five. It's actually doing literally the beginning to the current row, not from the beginning 
to the current row and all of its peers. And if you look at the sum, it's doing the same thing. Before it was two, two, I think it was two, two, six, six, um, 12, 12, right? Now it's literally going from beginning to the literal current row, just because I changed from rows to from range to rows. Okay. Um, here's a, this is exactly what we had before in terms of results. This is a little different. We're now going range mode, which means current row and its peers. And we're going from current row to current row. So we're not going to the beginning of any bore. We're not doing unbounded proceeding. Okay. We're going current row in range mode, which means again, it's peers. So that's why if you look at the center column, it's always two because it's always the current row and all its peers. Each row has one peer. So each row has a count of two. Okay. The sum is effectively all the sum of all of the current peers. In this case, one, one totals to two, two, two totals to four and so forth. Now I'm doing, now I've just changed from range current rows to rows current row. This is again, completely different. Now we're not looking at peers anymore. Current row literally means current row. When you look at the count, each row is itself. It doesn't look and see any other rows. And, the, and if you look at the sum, the sum is the sum of the row itself. That's it. There's nothing else there. Okay. Here's the first use of something called partition by. So in partition by, you basically can create little sub partitions so that instead of looking at the whole set, you effectively look at just a small piece of the set. Okay. So it allows you to take your full result set and break it up into partitions. Okay. So um, effectively when I do partition by, it behaves the same as range current row because the partition matches within the window frame. So effectively I've made every identical peer with the same X be a new partition. And that's why if you look at the count, each partition has a value of two. And the, what's interesting, and in fact, let's go to the next slide, I think is, is this will show it. Um, no, actually back up. I'm sorry. So, so I, I guess I don't have a slide for this, but the point is that this is partition by X range unbounded proceeding to current row. So I didn't do current row to current row. I said the whole partition, but because I've broken each two row set into its own partition, it effectively behaves this way. So the interesting thing here is you can actually look at your data differently. You don't have to use the same, you can actually use unbounded proceeding to current row, current row to current row, or you can create a partition. There's actually, if you're, depending on what you're trying to do with your data, there's several ways you can go at it. This is a more concrete example. What I've effectively done here is I've created two partitions. Because if you look at the text at the top, I said partition by X greater than two. So I've created a partition of all the rows um, less than two, equal or less than two. And I've created a partition of all the rows greater than two. And you can see exactly what you'd expect here. If you look at the, if you look at the fourth, the, the, uh, the third column, the count of the partition is literally four for all of the ones less than two and literally six for all of them greater than two. And the sum is going to be unbounded proceeding to current row. We don't have an order by, so therefore current row includes all the whole partition. So it's always six in the first batch and 24 in the second batch. Uh, if I add an order by, things change. Now, current row actually means current row and its peers. This I know we're like layering complexity on top of complexity here. We've got a partition, or we partition our data into two sets, less than or equal to two and greater than two. And then we've done an order by, which effectively means that I've got a peer group. Um, and that's why if you look at the first two rows, they're identical because they're the same peer group. You get two and two. The second two rows are four and six. And then the second, the, the, the blue group is all different. It does the same behavior. So they're all paired up. The order by has created groups. I don't have a, I don't have a frame clause here. I don't have anything 
related to range or, or following or current row. I'm just using all the defaults here. And here it is with the defaults. So um, that the, what you're seeing here at the bottom in the result is effectively partition by x greater than 2, order by x, which sets the current row to be the peers. And then is effectively, because I haven't specified it in the previous slide, it's range between unbounded preceding and current row. That's why the 6 is there in red, because it's counting all unbounded preceding, which is the beginning of its partition, up to the end of its current row peer group. Watch what happens when I go into row mode. Same query. I just change range to rows. Okay. Completely different numbers, right? Notice one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six in the in third column. Okay. That's because when you look at current row in the query now, because I'm in rows mode, this literally means the current row. So effectively, it's the count is one, the second row is one and two, the third row is the three, four, one, two, three. And if you look at the sum, it's exactly what you expect. One plus one is two, then two plus one, one plus one plus two is four, and then six and the same, uh, the same goes down there. Okay, so that's, we just talked about frame clauses and the use of traditional wind, traditional aggregates, sum, count. It also works with average and everything else. I'll show you some examples later on. But I also want to cover window specific functions. These are these are not generic aggregates. These are aggregates specific to window functions. So the first one um, that's kind of interesting is row number. Okay, so row number is a window specific function. It effectively allows you to get to number your rows. Okay. So here I've taken my data set, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, and I've just run numbers on them. I'm just saying, give me a row number for each of these. And again, um, uh, the URL at the bottom kind of gives you a link to the Postgres docs. Lag, this is also a window specific function. It allows you to, to get one before the row. So I remember I said like rows proceeding. This is a little different. This allows you to not worry about the current row. You say, I just want in the current row, I want to have the value that's one before mine in the, in the partition. Okay, so for example, if I look at first row and I say, what's the row before mine? It's a null because there is no, no row before it. But if I take a look at the second row, the row before it is one. The third row is where it gets interesting. It's saying, it's saying what's my row before current row, it's actually one. Okay. So again, it just kind of shifts. In this case, it basically is shifting everything back one. Um, there are some uses for this. I'll show you later. Lag is, uh, can be more than one. So now I'm saying, give me get in the current row for the column I've specified, give me the value of the row that's two before mine, instead of one before mine, two before mine. As you can see, the first two rows, there is nothing before it, but when you get to the third row, it sees the one and then walks all the way up. But you can see at the bottom, it never gets to five because there, it's too far off. It's, it would roll off the end. Here's an example of lag and lead together. So here I've got the lag um, uh, with the two rows before, and I've got the lead, which gives me the two rows forward of that, okay? Um, which you might not have realized, but that actually does, uh, does work. Okay. So you can basically say, give me the row that's before ahead of me. And that's exactly what's doing. That's why, for example, the, the, the left, the right hand column, uh, the first row is two because it's saying for this row, give me the row that's two ahead of me. Um, and then once you get to the end, there are no rows ahead. So effectively, um, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And you can also def specify defaults for missing rows. Okay. Uh, two or more functions, first value and last value. This is kind of interesting. Um, this is going to give me the first, uh, value in my, I think in my frame. Yes. In my window frame. 
Now, in this case, my window frame is uh, is interesting. Uh, look at the second column, the first value in our window frame. Remember, I haven't specified a frame here, so it's unbounded proceeding to current row. So the first the first value in my frame is one, right? Because the, the frame is the entire thing. It's always unbound proceeding, so it's one. So just one repeats one the whole time. The third column, the last column, effectively is going, give me the last value, not in the whole partition, but in my frame. And my frame in this case is unbounded proceeding to current row. So effectively, it's really giving me my row because it's going from the beginning up to my row or up to my peers. Um, and here's another one. Here we're actually sort of twisting it a little bit. We're, we're doing first value and last value, but we're also specifying the frame now as being unbounded proceeding to unbounded following. So instead of it being unbounded proceeding to current row, we're unbounded proceeding to unbounded following. And effectively that's why the last column is five now, because I now, from my current row, I can now see the end of my partition where I couldn't do that before. It's only the unbounded following that allowed me to, to get the fives there. Um, nth value, this is a little sort of trickier. Uh, instead of saying lag and lead um, or proceeding and following, you're basically saying, give me the nth value in my window frame. Um, so here I'm showing the third value in my window frame and the seventh value in my window frame. You can see in the second column that effectively until the third row, there is no third value in the window frame as defined by the default that we've used for our window function, window frame, okay? Um, and you can see in the right-hand column that effectively it takes until the seventh row until it actually has a seven a value. And until then it doesn't, does nothing to give you. Like there is no seventh value in this, in this window frame, so I can't give it to you. That's effectively what it does. Now, um, if, and, and, if I actually, this is kind of interesting, if I say range between unbranded proceeding and current row, I still get the same results, okay? And that's because of the way these nth values work. I'll show you some, I'll show you the, some of the later slides kind of explain why this is happening that way. It's because it doesn't operate on a window frame, it operates a little differently, okay? Um, here we're now do, doing unbounded proceeding and unbounded following, and then now we get, kind of what we kind of expect. Um, if I could you back up one slide. Yeah, the reason I think this is doing this is because my frame is range between unbounded proceeding and current row. So it can't get to the end of my partition. Um, next slide. But if you look at this one, you now we're going frame is unbounded proceeding and unbounded following and now you can see the full partition and you get two and four so it actually is is able to see from the current row is able to see the full partition whereas it couldn't before because of the way the frame was defined um this is a new another function um uh, this is not a very illustrative example um but effectively what this is doing is it's giving you a ranking of your rows within the partition. Now, in this case, because um, they operate on the current row in the partition, we haven't defined a partition clause that's clear here. So effectively the rank is, is meaningless. Uh, but the next slide gives you a better example. Um, so the, pro the reason be for this behavior is you're, you're asking for a rank of a range between unbounded proceeding and current row. And effectively, we talked about it before, range between unbounded proceeding and current row is the entire set. So you, can't, you don't get anything. It, range and rank cannot really produce anything without a valid frame clause in this case. But, and, and even in rows mode, it, 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 it's really kind of useless. Um, but here's where it starts to make some sense, okay? Um, effectively, what we're new by adding an order by, now my frame clause makes sense. And effectively, I'm now ranking and doing dense rank within my rows, okay? 
So if you take a look at column two, it's saying the first row, one, one, is the first set. And then the third row, and because they're identical, they're ones, they're duplicates, okay? But then the, the two is actually the third value because there's two number ones, okay? And the same thing with the three, it's the fifth because there's, there's four before it, okay? Um, so the reason, what, what rank does is when there's duplicates, it leaves an empty slot. It, it leaves an empty number. So there is no second rank here. Because there's two first ranks, the next value happens to be three, the third, you know. And what ranking effectively does is just trying to order the values based on the rank from one being the most, the earliest value, and then in this case, nine or whatever being the latest value, okay? When we look at dense rank, it's a little different. It's the same as rank, except it doesn't leave empty slots if there's duplicates. So effectively, there's two first places. There's two second places. There's two third places and two fourth places and so forth. Okay. So that's the difference between rank and dense rank. It's really just ranking the values based on the order by, but rank is, is reserving spaces for duplicates and therefore renumbering the later values. Dense rank does not do that. Okay, uh, here's two more, three more functions, which um, I took a lot of explaining to understand for me. Um, what, what these are attempting to do is trying to tell you for each given value, what percentage of the set is le equal or less than the current value, okay? For percentile rank, it's actually um, the rows less than the current row, okay? Um, and it excludes, the, it, exp it pretends the current row doesn't exist. So for example, uh, the, the, the value two, 22% um, of the rows are less than two. Assuming the current row is not in the set, which is just a weird description. I did put a blog about it. Uh, I wrote a blog recently that I'm going to be putting out about why this is. Um, it's kind of quirky. Cumulative distance is a little, cumulative distribution is a little easier. Um, effectively, what percentage of rows are equal or less than my row? So for one, 20% are equal or less than my row. For two, 40% are equal or less than my row. For three, 50%, 40%, for three, 60%. And obviously for five, 100%. Are less or equal or less than my row. And then the n tile is trying to give you um, uh, in n tile three in this case, it's trying to break the group up into threes. So it's gonna give it's gonna give some numbers a one, one, some segments, the top segment one, and then the next segment two and three. And I can put every number out one in there. I just put three in. Uh, but the only you know that's gonna break your set down into basically these segments. Okay, um, here's the same, we're going, we're back to an earlier query here. Um, we're using, uh, we're using partition by, remember partition by basically broke the data up into two sets. And what you've noticing here is that effectively rank and dense rank restart counting when the partition changes. So take a look at rank, it's one, one, three, three for the first four rows. And then it starts one, one, three, three, five, five for the second partition. So when you using rank or dense rank, you're not really using it across the entire set. You're using it only within the, the current partition. Same thing with dense rank. Um, here's the same query that we did earlier with percent rank, cumulative distribution, and n tile, except it's now in a partition. And again, the same concepts apply. Notice that in red, that's one partition and the percent rank is only computed within that partition. Blue is a second partition. Again, those three functions are computed only within that partition. Okay, so what have we gone into? We've gone, I showed you the window syntax. I showed you window functions with generic aggregates. And I've shown you a whole bunch of specific window functions 
uh, that are or specific and specific aggregates that are used just as window functions. This is kind of the most interesting part where we kind of take it and we bring the whole thing together by showing you actual examples with real data. Okay, so this is basically going to show you like what is going on. And what I did was I took uh, there is a tutorial there at the bottom. Uh, if you want to look at the tutorial that we supply, I created kind of a little tutorial here, um, creating an employee table, and then I guess I got eight employees or something like that. And I created, uh, for some reason, employees are always a good example for this. So I just created an employee table and I populated with a bunch of employees and a bunch of salaries and their departments. And we're going to do some analysis on that. So let's, that's the table right there. Okay. We have seven employees. They're in different departments. Um, they have different salaries and obviously uh, different names. So here's a very traditional aggregate, not, not related to window functions at all, okay? Give me a count, give me a sum, give me an average, okay? Seven employees, average is 42,200, I'm sorry, sum is 42,200, 40, average is 572.86. Okay, that's not a window function, just traditional. We can all, this is also not a window function. Now I'm getting totals by department. So tell me how many people are in each department. Give me the department names. How many people in each department? What's the sum of the salary for those departments? What's the average for those departments? No window functions. Okay. Uh, again, still no window functions. I'm now using a roll up function to say, I want to see the departments, but now I also want to see uh, a roll up of the total for the department. So what I'm now doing is you can see the three departments and now at the bottom, you see a null there, which indicates it's a roll up result and it gives me the total. So it's giving me my, my, my detail and then my roll up uh, total for the, all the departments. Okay. Um, here's a, here's another query again, still no window functions yet. We're basically saying, give me the name, give me the salary order by the salary decreasing. So now we have the most highest paid employees all the way down to the, to the least. Okay. Here's my first window function, completely useless, maybe of the use of the window function, but effectively what I'm doing here is I'm saying, give me the employee name, give me the salary for the employee and then give me a sum over the entire set. Remember the parentheses. We're saying, give me the sum, give me the entire set here, okay? And you can basically see, here's the, here's the 40,200 40, sum for each row. It hasn't rolled it up. It's actually kept the rows distinct. I still have seven employees, but now I have the sum included, the sum for the entire set included as a column in that table. Okay, here is a little different. There might, this might not be very useful to you, but there are some uses for it. What I'm doing now is I'm giving me, give me the employees ordered by salary and give me the cumulative salary. Because remember, look at that text in red, the order by salary descending. We're basically to have no window function. We have no window frame here. So it's gonna be unbounded proceeding to current row. So it's basically as it goes forward, it's going to, the, 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 the set gets a little bigger um, and you can see at the end. This is not so useful. It is useful if you're doing things like time series data, but that, that's kind of a silly example, I think. Uh, this is a little better. Now I'm telling it, give me the name, give me the salary. Instead of giving me the total of all of the salaries, give me the average for the entire set. I think this is interesting. So now you can see each person's salary and how they compare to the average in the whole set. This could not be done without window functions. Even more interesting, give me the difference of the person's salary against the average for the entire company, all right? And you can see in blue, these are over the average. And you can see, I'm sorry, red is over the average and blue is under the average, okay? But you can see now, this is pretty cool. With window functions, take a look at what I did up there in red. I said, 
give me the salary of the user and subtract it from the average window function over the entire set. That's what average salary over parentheses parentheses did in an earlier slide. This is where all the stuff we've talked about now starts to come together. Okay, so we're now looking at the difference between the guy person's salary and the average. Okay, and that's that's I think that's kind of illustrative. Um, this is also kind of interesting. Now we're using the lead um, uh, function here. Give me, we're going to order the, we're going to take the salaries, we're going to order them by salary. Okay, we'll take the employees, order them by salary, and then we're going to subtract their salary from the next salary, and we're going to see the difference between their salary and the person who works, who's, who's the next least salary to them. So you can even see the gaps between Mike and James and James and Betty and so forth all the way down. And Carol has no value because there's nothing to compare her against because there's no value. There's no row after hers for the lead. Um, this is this is interesting. Um, <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain, but effectively what I've done is I've used the last value function to get the salary of the least of the employee making the least amount of money. Okay. And then I've given first name, first column's the name, second column's the salary. Third column is how much more are they making? How much more is this person making than the person with the lowest salary? Okay. And then the last column is saying what percent are they making more than the person with the lowest salary? You can see how last value now becomes kind of interesting. And in fact, I used a special window clause here, unbounded proceeding to unbounded following, so I could actually see the entire set when I run this query. That's starting to get useful. Okay. Um, what's my rank of my employees? So if I had to say, okay, Mike, number one in terms of salary, James, number two in terms of salary, Betty, number three. Look at Andy and Sandy. They're both number four. Okay. And then Tracy for rank, she's number six because we leave a gap because we have a duplicate. If we look at dense rank, we don't have a gap. Tracy ends up being number five. But now I'm using rank for my employees' salaries. Okay. This is even cooler. Okay. Now I'm looking at the salaries by department because, and this is kind of interesting, what you find in organizations is that the departments have a tendency to have a certain salary range that's kind of unique to that department. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's different in all companies, but sometimes sales has, has a certain range of values and shipping or, or marketing have different range of values. So what we're doing now is if you look at the, you know, the first column, the second column, the third column are pretty the same. The fourth column gives me the average for that department, not for the whole set, but the average for that department using the partition by clause, because I said partition by department. And then the third, the last column gives me the difference between that salary and the average salary for that department. So if you can see here, for example, James is making a thousand dollars more than the average for that department, All right? Uh, that's kind of an interesting number, and you can kind of again looking at the numbers. It kind of it kind of it's an interesting way to analyze it. And again, have, being able to do this in SQL is is quite is quite useful. Um, what I did here is I took the same query and instead of repeating partition by department all over the place. I actually create a window function, a window uh, identifier called D. And now I just say over D. I get the same results, but I've taken the clause partition by department and I've brought it, I've, I've defined it at the bottom and then I just use over D in the places that I need it. Um, okay, so this is taking the current salary and comparing it to the next salary within the department, okay? So here we're saying 
we're, we're saying, for example, Mike is making 800 more than the next person in the department. Now, Betty, she has a null for the last column because there is nobody else in her in her partition, department to partition, that makes a lesser salary. Okay, same thing with Sandy. She, I mean, with Carol, she doesn't have anybody else. James, for example, in this case, Kate makes um, twelve hundred dollars more than the next person in his department. Okay, and Andy makes six hundred more than his department. So I'm not looking at averages now. I'm looking using lead. I'm saying, give me the next value and give me how much difference it is from that to the next value. Um, this is interesting. So now um, I'm actually computing two ranks. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm computing a rank by department in column four. You can see one, two, one, two, one, two, three. And I'm also computing the global rank of the employee within the entire salary range. And notice the numbers are, are in weird order. Like Mike is number one, we get that. But Betty is number three in the, the, in the company, even though she's second in terms of her department, okay? Um, Carol, interestingly, is number seven um, in terms of salary, um, even though she's second in her department for salary, you see what I'm saying? Okay. So I hope that's kind of given you a framework to understand how these things are useful, what they're good for. Um, again, there is completely contrived data, but you can kind of get an exam, an idea of how you can now do really meaningful analysis of your data without having to bring it to a client and bring it into a spreadsheet and do some kind of computation with it. I'm not saying it's simple. I think the concepts are hard to understand, the whole partition concept, the whole frame concept. It's just really difficult to kind of get, but I think it is, uh, it is useful. So to wrap up, um, let's look at some considerations we have here. Okay. Um, so if you're creating window functions, uh, you really have to decide, first off, do you need to split your set? Do you have to create partitions? Um, that's probably your first decision. Is it going to be one entire set or do you want sub-partitions in there? Uh, do you want any order in the partition? So do you want them all to be the same or do you want some kind of predefined order? Because that really defines how a lot of these functions behave. Do you want to handle rows with the same order by values, range versus row? Rank versus dense rank. This is a question of how you handle duplicates within your order by clause. Do you need to find a window frame? Maybe if you're using um, a window frame several times in your query, you should probably should. Um, so uh, you keep in mind that each window function can define independently its own ordering, its own partitions, and its own window frame. So you can have a query with all sorts of columns, and each column can use its own ordering, partitioning, and window framing, okay? Um, multiple, you can even define multiple window names if you want. Um, if you want to, you can actually, I didn't show you an example of that, but that's possible. Um, and pay attention whether window functions operate on frame or partitions. That's gonna be, that's gonna be pretty key. This slide, I think, kind of brings it all together. Um, I know it's a kind of a clunky slide, uh, but effectively, what I'm trying to show you here, starting from left and right, is you've got two types of functions. You've got functions that operate on frames, okay? That means, you know, rows range between unbounded preceding and current row or whatever, okay? And then you've got, you've got functions that operate on partitions. Those are not the same thing. A partition is basically the entire set or the entire set defined by the partition by clause, okay? In terms of frame types, there's two types. There's computational frames. These would be your generic aggregates like average and sum. And then there are row access frame functions like first value, last value, and nth value. In terms of partition clause, you have row access functions like lead, lag, and row number. In some ways, lead and lag overlap first value and last value, but they are different, particularly because one operates on frames and one operates on partitions. 
And then there's the ranking capability, cumulative distance, dense rank, and tall percent rank and rank so forth, which give you that um, capability. Um, keep in mind the functions will never work outside their partitions, um, but you don't have to use a partition clause if you don't want one. And that's it. Um, I hope I've given you, I know it started out kind of confusing. There's all these range and, and so forth and uh, partition by and so forth, but I hope I've given you sort of a clear exp explanation of how that syntax works. We talked about how uh, generic aggregates work with 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 frame, window functions, window clauses, and then we talked about a lot of the special uh, window functions that are available, and then I showed you some very good examples, I think, of how you can use your window functions for data analysis. And with that, I will conclude my talk. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. We had uh, a little questions from our audience. Let me see some questions for you. Uh, uh, first question they, they, we have is concerned about the performance using Windows function where you put your indexes. And another question, use partition tables uh, with window functions too. I will pass to you and later I, I give you more questions. Okay, so um, Postgres window functions understand the existence of indexes. Um, however, in a lot of cases, the window functions are operating only after, oh, how do I explain this? In, in a lot of ways, the window function is operating only after the result set is done. So if you think about how um, window functions work and the fact that they look up and down in the result set, in a lot of cases, you have to produce the result set first. And then we operate, we do the window functions on that result set. So there isn't a lot of advantage, there isn't a lot of use of indexes specifically to window functions because you gotta, you gotta generate the result first. Okay, excuse me. Um, in terms of partitions, uh, Postgres window functions are independent of part I know I use, a, there's a partition by clause, but that's unrelated to Postgres data partitioning. Um, uh, so they both work together. Um, there should be no, you know, there's no reason they're, they, they're independent concepts and they, they'll, they'll certainly make use of their, of both capabilities. Okay. Another question here, it's about, um, the execution plan, but you, you already talked about this and let me see. Um, oh, uh, if there are any, any roadmap to implement exclude clause. I'm sorry, what was, the, what was the name of the clause? Yeah, that, that's an, an clause and, uh, and SQL <coughs> that uh, use excludes in the window functions. Oh, uh, you know, I, I don't remember. I think we might, I think we, I, I, you know, I'm gonna look that one up. I don't remember what we did with that. I remember, I remember people talking about it. Um, I think we support it. Um, you know, maybe we don't. Uh, hmm. let, you, me, let me go up You can here. look later and answer our later. You, 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 yeah, maybe I'm you don't know by did, now. Uh, if we didn't get that done. I, I, there are there are one or two things that we didn't implement, and that might be one of them. Okay, no problem. Well, we had uh, by now about uh, forty-two people looking now, and I think is that there is no more questions, and we can. And now I, I want to thank you very much for your uh, your talk. I think it's a, it's a very deep subject. And I, th I think that uh, people talking in the chat like very much and they can understand uh, most of part of your subjects. And uh, we hope you, we can see 
you again in another conference. Yeah, it would be my pleasure. I guess the only thing I have to leave is that um, it, I had to go back to these slides over and over again to improve them over and over. So you might find in a week or two when you come back to this topic, you might want to go back to the slides on my website and reorient yourself because when you write it once, you go through it once, when you go back over it, you start to see things that you didn't see before. So there's little nuances in these slides that might not have been apparent at the time, um, but hopefully this will give you an understanding that, that eluded me for years. Uh, but I think I finally understand it. So uh, I, hopefully that is going to be true of everyone else. I remember I, I read, made, made a talk about the window function a couple of years ago, and that's not easy to, to explain this. And I, I, I look very, very... Uh, the, your examples were was great, and it, it was easy to understand uh, a couple of things I admit I don't understand yet. Yeah, yeah, they're very true. Like I started Googling around the answers to some of these, and I was like, "There's a." I can't tell you how many times I would search for window functions SQL, and somebody would say, "You know, they'd have a blog entry and they'd say, here's a query, and here's a result, and here's what it does,' and then that was it. Like they, nobody wanted to really walk through what each piece does, you know, and and that was frustrating to me. So, you know, I basically, yeah, I spent the time and tried to understand the whole thing. So, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank you again. And tomorrow we will have another talk with Euler Tavera talking about the, the, oh, what's the talk? It's about uh, replica logical replication. Okay, so that will be in Portuguese. But this talk, we will make some caption in Portuguese, maybe for the next week. So thank you again and good night for everybody.